from the heart of Manchester. Welcome to your Manchester lunchtime live. Oh yes indeed, a very good afternoon to each and every one of you joining me, Ms. Belinda Scandal here for our very first episode of our lovely lunchtime live. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you. We're going to be speaking to our lovely Carl Austin Behan. So if you've got any questions, any suggestions, anything that you want us to ask one of our fabulous LGBT czars, this is the place to ask. So once again, how are we all doing today? It's been a gorgeous weather. It's been raining all morning here in Manchester. But as always, here I am, Miss Melinda Scandal, trying to cheer you all up on this gorgeous day by bringing you our first and fabulous guest is, of course, Mr. Carl Austin Behan. Born in 1972. Can you fully believe it? That's it doesn't and that makes me feel very old as well. It really does. Now, he's a British former politician and community activist who currently serves as LGBT plus da, 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 advisor to the mayor of Greater Manchester. You might have heard of our, great, um, our mayor of Greater Manchester, a guy called Mr. Andy Burnham, everybody. Now, he also served as Lord Mayor of Manchester from May 2016 to May 2017, being the first openly gay Lord Mayor. He was Labour councillor for Burnage. Nice. From 2011 to 2018. Oh. Good afternoon, Carl Austin Behan. Good afternoon. How are we? Lovely How weather. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on your, your very first podcast. Well, you know, I always go to the best first, you know, and then we see how we get on. There are so many questions that we are wanting to ask today. Uh, the first of which we would like to start with asking you, uh, how is Manchester coping at the moment? Um, I think we're being very resilient. Um, I know that we've sort of taken a bit of a battering from the government. Um, you know, it was very upsetting on Friday night, walking around the streets of Manchester at 10 o'clock to see everywhere closed. Um, that includes in restaurants, uh, places where I have been trying to uh, to make the effort. And it is, it's a sad, 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 sad time at the moment for everybody, not just uh, within the LGBTQ plus community, but also right the way across Greater Manchester with these bizarre tier three restrictions. Do you feel that um, the pubs have been targeted? Oh, yes. Yeah, I think the pubs have been targeted and I think um, unfairly so as well. And that includes the fact that when they put on the um, the restrictions with the curfew, the 10 p.m. curfew made no difference. I was in bars myself and I was out and then seeing people being ushered out of venues at quarter to 10 for them, people only to be going to the shops, buying a lot of alcohol, and then going back to their houses for, for their own parties. And let's face it, you know, Manchester, we've got such a massive, massive student population. People come to Manchester and Salford and Bolton and, you know, other areas of Greater Manchester just to sort of enjoy themselves and to grow up and to, to have that education. And then to sort of be forced not to be able to go out, you know, it's, it's never going to work. It isn't going to work, and you, and you can't blame the students, and you can't blame um, blame people because we were let down by the government in the first place when they allowed the likes of Dominic Cummings to get away with what was a very strict lockdown. Yeah, yeah I just find it strange that one one comment that's really sort of ricocheting around my mind throughout this whole time is how can it be okay for 15 to go to uh, sorry for 30 to go to a funeral and get only 15 to go to a wedding? Could you perhaps explain the logic to that? There is none. No. I don't think there is. No, because, you know, there, there, is, there is no logic with this. And like, when we're saying about the fact that, you know... Could you, could you perhaps explain the logic to that? Ignore that. Okay. <laughs> Go on, sorry. No, it's, and um, I just think when we're talking about, when we're saying about the bars... And now, you know, bars are being encouraged now to um, turn themselves into sort of restaurants or places that you can have a substantial meal. That, again, defeats the object of what they set out to do. And yet they're, they're saying, no, that that's OK to do. You know, they're saying about the, you know, we can go out, you can have a business meeting, you can, you can have more people there. So I just don't get it. No, it feels very, very strange. Uh, we'd be remiss not to talk about these school dinners. And the amount of um, MPs that decided that school dinners shouldn't go to the children. Explain that for us. Again, um, 
I know that, you know, Marcus Radford has done such an amazing job sort of raising this awareness about, you know, ending to, uh, child food poverty, you know, that we all know that children shouldn't go hungry. Um, you know, for someone like him, using his status to raise awareness, I think he's fantastic. I think the government should be ashamed of themselves. Um, you know, and, and let, let's look at who's actually pulling this together now. You know, you've got, you know, this uh, footballer, obviously, Marcus, but then restaurants and cafes and pubs are all coming together to sort of supply food and supply people. And these are the same people who are being hit strongly with the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, and I just think, you know, I think it's opening a debate. And I mean, I was talking to someone yesterday and I've never really had this debate about school meals before because when I was at school, I was lucky I had school meals, but one of my brothers, when my dad was uh, unemployed, he had free school dinners. And that was back in the day where you used to have two different uh, coloured um, dinner tickets. And it just made me think about the fact that, you know, you, you, you're creating a class system straight away by showing people who have free meals and people who pay for school meals. And then it made me think maybe, maybe what we should do is when it comes to giving parents the uh, child benefit, which every child in the UK is receives, or a parent uh, of, of, each, of the child receives child benefit, maybe we, at source, we take away whatever it costs for, for providing school meals. But, and, and school meals provided by all schools all year round for all pupils. So we've yeah. taken the money, we've already taken the money at cost. Um, so that we, we, we're getting rid of that class system, whereas those people who ha do have a, um, a paid-for school meal against those that do have free school meals, I just think it'd be a, a simpler way of doing it. And that way, it would be the same budget that you would know that was going to the schools for school meals, whether it's people getting them free or whether they're paid for. Yeah, Boris Johnson, um, apparently, according to the Manchester Evening News today, is looking to increase funding for the poorest families over Christmas in an attempt to defuse a revolt over free school meals. And the Times quoted allies of the Prime Minister saying planning was underway to provide additional support for eligible pupils outside term time due to hardships facing during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, of course, there's still never, as there is, never a response from um, Number 10 itself. No, and also it, it seems strange, you know, we, they, they're saying this now, now we've, now people are doing things and, and people are sort of trying to pull things to action and get the, the get them to sort of support this. But again, he's not saying that he's giving meals, is he? He's still saying that they're going to give more financial support. Whereas by doing the correct thing and giving the school meals and funding that properly means that it's the schools, uh, the children that will benefit because... Unfortunately, it could be a case of them, them not getting the meals. Uh, the MPs locally, our lovely MPs dotted around our lovely great um, region, what power do they actually have in overturning any decisions that are made by Parliament? Well, I think it's more a case of when it actually goes to, to Parliament. And I think the problem we've got is um, because it's a Tory government and they're quite strict on what, what they're doing, um, we know here in Greater Manchester, you know, um, the majority of our MPs are Labour MPs. Um, you know, and they are, one thing that I thought was really powerful last week was when we had the, the Ten Boroughs and Andy all sort of trying to get the extra money for uh, going into Tier 3. And it, it showed unity. It showed them, them all coming together and actually all standing up at, at the same time without, you know, and it, it wasn't a case of playing areas off against each other it was a united front and and i think that was a really powerful message and i think that in a way that's what scared the government a little bit the fact that there was some tory mps as well that supported greater manchester uh, and supported the, the the region as a whole and you know i know i've said this before but also i think the whole north south divide is going to become stronger and i think um when you look at the the way that the way that the media down south portrays the north it is very much a case of, you know, they, they don't, I don't think they realise the demographics of the of the areas and the makeup that we've got. And to sort of give us the 60 million that, that they sort of offered, you know, when we look at, we've got 10 boroughs, we've got a difference in those 10 boroughs of whether you've got somewhere like Rochdale with 220,000 people, whether you've got uh, Oldham with like 190,000 people, whether you've got Manchester itself with over 800,000 people. But then when you put the 60 million together, that's only 6 million pound per borough. Um, mm -hmm. So it's 
you know, they're all going to be fighting for, for a share of that. So it needs to be done centrally. There's no point with turning around so, and... With the helping that we've got from the um, from the MPs, uh, is there yeah. going to be a pop-up with their funding from the local government, local councils? Um, I'm not sure on that one, uh, because, the, because, again, the local councils themselves have had so much money cut um, over and over again. I know that when they looked at doing the actual uh, what was needed, it worked out that ninety million pounds was needed for um, for supporting businesses and the furlough, and and then they managed to sort of think, okay, we could we could we could we could manage seventy five, um, but then I think they they were they were all quite happy to try and find a million pound each, so they, they took it to to the sixty five, and I think that was the lowest lowest uh, budget you could possibly go for, and. And I just think that, you know, the, the amount of money is peanuts compared to how much is being wasted on things like the, the track and trace system. That, you know, the amount of people who signed up to it thinking they're doing the right thing to, again, it's just completely flawed and it's costing so much money. It's all craziness as far as I can see. Uh, do you see an end to all this? And what would be the ultimate goal um, and the ultimate end point for you? Um, I think that by doing all these wishy-washy ways of, um, of, of, of running everything and the tier three, we now may have a tier four coming into place. I yeah. think, I, I personally think that we need to do, uh, this might be a bit controversial, but I think we need to do a complete, complete lockdown for four weeks uh, of the country. And I mean, where to and to sort of try and just completely stem the virus completely because um, all these, you know, Wales are doing this thing for two weeks now uh, where they're in complete lockdown. However, after two weeks, are we going to be opened up again? Are people from England going to be able to go into Wales and are Wales going to come back into Man uh, to, to uh, England? And again, it's just going to keep keep going until we manage to either find... So just, on, um, just on that point then, Carl, um, obviously Gran Canaria, very popular destination for the LGBT plus people. Um, they're obviously going to be thinking about getting away from this country when uh, they can, as soon as they can. Would you suggest that this is a, a sensible thing to do or would you suggest that it's more of a dangerous thing to do to go away to these countries and then come back into our fair city? Um, I think people. Are, I, go, I think people are going to go away if they're given that opportunity. I don't think we can. We can stop people. I know that we're not. We're advised not to travel um, out of a tier three. I mean, I'm supposed to be going down to Devon uh, this weekend, but can't go because of obviously being in tier three. So we're not supposed to travel anywhere anyway. Yeah. Um, it was that thing. I know that you know parts of uh, the Canaries are open, um, and they've and they've taken away the fact that you need to sort of do the self isolation. I think it's about people taking uh, common sense that they feel themselves. And I think, you know, we, we're being pushed that, that there are rules and restrictions. But I think to, to, to be real strict, I mean, like the furlough, you know, they, they're talking around um, with the staffing wise, paying the 67%. If venues yeah. aren't open, who's going who's gonna to pay that extra uh, money to keep those people uh, in jobs? Some of that, that's going to have a massive effect. Regarding the travel, I, I, I don't think it's advisable. But at the same time, I think that people are just so fed up and getting so many mixed messages. Carl Austin Behan, thank you so much for your time today. That just wrap up our first episode here today. Carl Austin, once again, thank you ever so much. Um, and we will catch up with you very, very soon. Always wise words from our Carl Austin Behan there. Um, stick around on Wednesday, everybody. We've got another fantastic show lined up for you, and we'll tell you more about that as well. Don't forget, on Wednesday evening, we've got our live video show for you with Michelle Eagleton and myself. That's all coming your way. Stick around. Thanks very much for everybody watching Lunchtime Live. <laughs>